James Dutton for Pro Boxing fans here today on Zoom, joined with Wayne Elcock, former British champion. Wayne, how you doing? I'm good, thanks, mate. Yeah, strange times, but yeah, I'm coping. How, how, how you how you dealing with it? How are you coping? What are you doing with yourself these days? Mate, I'm trying. I'm training like a champion at the minute. It's crazy. Uh, I've been training every day just to keep my mind sane and. Uh, yeah, I'm just using the time really, which I haven't had really. We're usually training other fighters and, and running businesses and stuff. I've not really had a chance to do a lot of my own training, so uh, I've just used it for that, really. That's true. Well, you mentioned there, obviously, your own business, you run your own uh, sort of retail shop, box and equipment store. Yeah, um, we've got the boxing store, yeah. How's that going? And why did you go into it? It's not really a, a move that we see many boxers go into. Yeah, you know what? And that, that was part of the reason why I did, because I felt that. Uh, there wasn't many people in the sport or, or who owned retail shops in, involved in boxing that were actually giving the right advice. Whereas I was running a club myself, I trained boxers myself, I've been a boxer myself. I thought it was the best person to speak to when you come into a store and you want the right guy. So, you know, there's a lot of time that, thankfully, a lot of the local clubs supported me because obviously you're going against big businesses out there, uh, especially online and stuff, whereas my USP is really the fact that you can come into store and I can actually get you the right gear. Uh, so we're more in store than actually online. Uh, but for me, it, it was literally a matter of being able to give them the right advice. And, 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 you know, obviously a lot of the time we give them a few training tips as well when they're coming so they get a bit of extra as well. So, yeah, that was the part of the reason why I went into it. I was fed up with my fighters coming into the gym uh, when they've been somewhere else. And I'm not going to start mentioning stores, but they've been somewhere else. And literally uh, they were coming back with the wrong gear, you know, 12 inch gloves when they should have been in 16 and, and so forth. And then they're going back and, Obviously, then there's a, a dispute then with the shop owner to say, like, literally, you know, well, you know, you need to, you, my coach said I need 16s and you've only given me 12s. He's like, well, you've worn them. Well, yeah, oh, sorry, mate, I can't have them back. And, you know, it's that kind of thing. So it's kind of little things like that, really, that got me going. And as I say, when I looked into it, uh, I found out that there wasn't a lot of experience really on the retail sector in terms of people that have actually done the sport. And that was what kind of made me go into it. So in terms of, you mentioned there, so you give the advice, you know what gear they need. How important is that for a young you know, amateur coming in who might not have uh, or be so clued up with the um, equipment? Absolutely massive for me. Uh, I mean, I started off when I started off wearing the old Brian mitts when I was a kid and whatever. We know padding him and whatever. It's just because my family didn't have a lot of money, so I used to use what the club had. Uh, and I believe that. Uh, gave me a lot of injuries, especially as an amateur, but then it obviously impacted me as a professional as well when I ended up having quarter zones in my hands and stuff. And I always put that back down to the stage of hitting a bag where you remember back in the day, they'd literally think it was great to put a bit of concrete in a bag and whatever, you know, to make it a little bit harder and so forth. And the harder the bag, the better, which was the worst thing possible, so to speak, and especially when you're wearing a pair of mitts with hardly any padding in. So again, mitts, I'm not a massive fan of mitts. Uh, I believe that they especially if you can punch a little bit, that they, they, they was a downfall, or we'll say, which, you know, caused me a lot of problems during my career. So I think it's important to make sure you're wearing the right gear, uh, same as headguards, you know, wearing headguards, certain headguards. Uh, the only thing that isn't really a massive plus uh, is probably probably boots in, in some respect. But even then, there's a certain boots that you can buy. It depends on the, on, the, on the style of fighter that you are. Again, people haven't really thought of that in the past or when I spoke to them in the shop. Uh, they haven't really thought of that. As I said, like, you know, your Mike Tyson kind of fighters, they'll wear lot lower boots because they don't need so much support around the calf. Whereas someone like myself, uh, your Ali's and your Leonard's and people like that have like a higher boot because obviously you get a lot more support around your calf, which makes a massive difference when you're in the boxing ring and you're having to move around, you know, uh, making sure you've got the right support. Uh, so even down to boots. Uh, so I always say, like, literally the only thing that is essential for me is your boots, your head guard and your gloves. You know, get them three things right and you're on the right path. It can avoid injury. It can help you progress. Remember, if you've got the wrong pair of gloves on, they might be too big, too much room in there, whatever it may be. Uh, that will foster a poor technique. You'll start trying to adjust your style uh, to box and hit the bag a certain way so it doesn't cause an injury. That's wrong. You need to be doing it the correct way from the start. So with the right equipment, that's what, you know, I give you the advice to, to do. Absolutely. And let's talk about the training side of things as well. Are you still doing that? Your training side books clever? Yeah, I mean, I, we still be coaching the schools and across the, the Midlands in schools and work with the camp stores and police and so forth, running mobile sessions across the country. Uh, that was the first thing that started when I finished boxing because it was just a matter of when I finished, I thought, how come there was hardly any champions? I think I was the first champion from Birmingham in like 12 years or something ridiculous like that. And he was like, why? You know, with a massive city, what's going on? And so that's why Box Clever kind of started. I thought, there's got to be another me out there somewhere. 
and that's how it all starts is a, a little bit of just trying to find you know that that kid that possibly could go on and, and carry you know uh, ride the flag for the city so to speak so uh, I enjoyed that I mean that's been going 11 years now uh, massively enjoyed that uh, and then obviously I started the amateur boxing club from the first kids that I actually trained on Box Clever we then went on to we, I think we've had six or seven national champions from there uh, and that was been running for the last eight years uh, and then I decided uh, last year just before all this happened to be fair well, the first kid I ever trained and my first ever national champion from the club I've just turned professional with the, the Cronk Birmingham uh, pro setup that I've established I still fund and, uh, and help the amateur club obviously uh, I've got the other guys running that now but I've moved back into the professional game now uh, and I'm training and managing these two guys to, to start you know start their journey which would have been in April, uh, if it wasn't for all this. How for fun is it for you, obviously, starting from going around school to Box Clever to the amateurs and now taking these guys into the pro ranks? Oh, I mean, it's a dream come true. As I say, especially it's the first kid I ever trained. One of them was the first kid I ever trained for Box Clever. Sent to me as a naughty boy from the council. You know, what can you do with this kid? He ended up boxing a load of amateur fighters for me and now he's turned pro. And as I say, the other one I've had them both from Babbage, you know, I had them from the age of 11. They're 21 now, you know, and... Uh, so it was always, I was always going to go back into the pros. You know, obviously I spent longer as a professional than I did as an amateur. I was, you know, uh, in the game, in, in, in the professional game a lot longer. So it was always going to be something that I was probably going to go back to. But the reason why I went into the, the uh, amateur game was literally to earn my stripes. I wanted to take someone from nothing and make him into something, which is what I did. You know, take a kid through the door that's never boxed and take him onto the national titles and won, won three of them, the one who's just turned pro. So, you know, we, we didn't do too bad there. But that proved to me that I could do it. It wasn't just trading on my name and what I've achieved in the sports. Uh, so, yeah, that was ultimately important to get my stripes before I actually went into the professionals. So is that your long-term goal now, coaching and management in the programme? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I want to bring more kids out. You know, I want to inspire more kids through the amateur club that we've got running. Uh, so obviously want to move on and build. We've only got, I've only got two bro boxes on, on, on purpose, to be fair, you know. Uh, I don't want to over populate my my pro setup. Uh, I want to give them the right correct time I feel that you know uh, I'm going to follow a lot of the, the lines that I chose that, that, I, that I run myself really when I was when I was a pro myself I'm going to go along the same sort of path uh, and make sure you know that they're getting a, a good solid foundation so that when the chances came like I did for myself against Eastman's and, and your finals even it was even though I was still relatively new against final and stuff I was ready for it because I've been brought along correctly so hopefully we can do the same with these guys. And you mentioned there about your your pro career. You've a pro for a long time. Um, I mentioned at the start of the interview. You know, you're a British champion, a yeah. WBU world champion. Uh, you changed the IBF yeah. world title as well. Um, yeah. Go back to your your career and what are your highlights of your pro career? Oh, it would be now looking back at it. It'd have to be the Howard Eastman fight. Uh, without a doubt. I mean, that was a fight that even you know I remember at the time when it was when it came about. I actually came back, believe it or not. Uh, I retired from the sport for a little bit. I uh, was disillusioned with the sports, left Frank, came back to Birmingham. Uh, and then I wasn't really interested in the sport, to be fair. I decided that I was going to go back to my day job. I was a BT engineer originally before the boxing kicked off. So I actually got back into that. And when the news got out that I'd left Frank, uh, I had a, lot of, a local promoters were asking me if I wanted to box again. And I was like, oh, I'm not interested. I love the sport, but you know, I'm not interested in getting back into it now, mate. It's too much bloody hassle. Uh, and they said, well, you've said in this re interview that you regret not boxing in Birmingham. So, like, yeah, I do. But, you know, I don't know if I want to go down back down. down. We can box you in Birmingham, you know. I thought, sorry, we'll just have one fight then. So, literally, uh, oh, I, I, you know, we had we chose Adam Rhodes from Manchester. I'd had a, a, a boxed earlier on in my career. Uh, I think I was about 3, 4, 14. He was about 14, 14 when we boxed. Uh, and it was a tight fight, to be fair. And I won it, but it was close. But as I say, you know, on, on the day, I, was, I just moved to Sports Network. Uh, so that was something that always bugged me that every time I kind of seen it, it was kind of like, you know, we kind of won that fight. So that's who I chose as my one-off fight. And it was really going to be a one-off fight. I thought I'd just do this and then I'll go back to my day job, so to speak. Uh, fought that and, uh, and knocked Darren out in, in the first round, uh, which set me up for the British title eliminator against Scott Dan. Again, I was ready to sort of leave the sport. Then, But then the law of the British title, who wouldn't want to win the British title? It's every fighter's dream. Uh, kind of lured me back in. I had to blag it with work and whatever. And I ended up going on the sick. And 
giving the bullshit there. The gaffer eventually gave me the time off. But if anything, it was the worst thing that could have happened to me at the time uh, because literally having that time off and the time to prepare and stuff at the end of it all took away the hunger. Because before that, I actually thought, I'm going to be on Sky Sports in a few weeks' time. The gaffer's going to see me and I'm getting the sack anyway. So I need to win this fight. So it kind of took the edge away. I didn't box great, as I say, in, in terms of historians and stuff. It was the first British title fight to be scored by three judges. And that's the only thing that was good about the fight, on my point of view. Uh, and so I was, my revenge mission was literally to get back to Scott Dunn. I believed I could beat him. Uh, unfortunately, he got injured in a, a car accident and Howard Eastman came in and said, oh, I'll have my belt back. <laughs> I thought, this wasn't the plan, uh, but I'm here now. Uh, and I remember speaking to Paddy Lynch, my trainer, a long-term trainer, and, and he used to uh, have Howard down quite a lot to spar Rob McCracken uh, back in the day. So he knew a lot about him. And, and literally, I took the fight really on the, on the advice of Paddy, if I'm being honest, in some respect. Paddy said, look, I know this kid. I know him inside out. I know you can beat him, and I know the, the style that will beat him. Uh, and, and I went in there on that sort of thing. Nobody really gave me a chance, other than the people that were close to me. Uh, he just beat Richard Williams. I think he'd knocked him out in 11 rounds. He was, you know, he just won the Commonwealth, added the Commonwealth title to it as well. So, you know, he wasn't really on a, in a, a bad form. I think he was, he was on to fight Abrams, which obviously I went on to take after beating him. So, uh, yeah, without a doubt, that was my career best win. Uh, Howard Eastman, never been beat by any British fighter. Uh, in a God knows how long. So, uh, well, no, he'd never been beat by a British fighter. So, you know, that was definitely the highlight of my career. You mentioned the, the Arthur Abraham fight that was for the IBF world title. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that. Obviously, um, you did lose that fight. What did you learn from that and take from that belt? I did, you know what? I didn't really. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I learned something that I can pass on to my own fighters. I'll be honest with you. It was like literally September when I, when I fought Howard and then it was December when I fought Abrams. Remember, I'd done a 12-week camp for Howard Eastman. I'm not making an excuse. I'm not saying I would have beat Abrams by any stretch of the imagination. He was a fantastic fighter. You know, but the preparation was not what I would have needed. Uh, we couldn't have any rest. As I said to you before earlier, I used to struggle with my hands. Uh, we had quarter zones in them after the fight. Uh, Eastman was obviously 12 tough rounds and then to get back into it as well you know my trainers like you know it's it's a massive opportunity Wayne you know you can't not take this fight it's the IBF and obviously I was never going to say no uh, but the training prep for it sparring we couldn't do couldn't really get any sparring in as such because I was still uh, nursing injuries uh, and, it, and I hated every day of training if I'm being honest and I loved training when I was fit but I did hate every day of that training camp because I'd just come off a big one after Howard Eastman uh, so uh, went in there really uh, just thinking let's just try and enjoy the experience what an experience is going to be and I did enjoy the experience I really did the, the lead up to the fight and, and all the rest of it was fantastic uh, and I remember getting in there and just thinking like you know it was treating it like a spa so most people were surprised when I was traveling the jab up and so forth and I was really enjoying myself but it was more like a spa than an actual fight in some respect just want to get the rounds under my belt give myself a bit of credibility and who knows I could obviously challenge further down the line when I've got better preparation uh, I think after about four rounds, I'm feeling really confident. This is going really well. This is brilliant. I'm really enjoying myself. I've come back to Paddy. I said, Paddy, I can beat this guy. No, no, stick to the game plan. Paddy, I can beat him. He said, what I've told you, just stick to the game plan. Don't get involved. No, no, I can beat him. I haven't really let my right hand go yet. Because obviously I was nursing it after getting a quarter zone in there before we flew out. So I'm going out into the fifth round. Literally thinking, this is it now. I'm going to walk him onto this right and Let's see how he takes the shot. And the next thing you know, I'm stood in my own corner with Paddy Lynch saying, what the hell did I tell you about his right hand and about standing there and trading? And I'm thinking, what the hell has gone on? <laughs> Literally, he wiped away a minute of my life, I swear. Uh, you know, obviously I walked onto his right hand and, and the, left, the referee escorted me to the corner, so to speak. Then I came round. <laughs> that guy, his punch power was phenomenal. Uh, there's a difference between, you know, uh, European, British level punch power, uh, world-class punchers. They can turn your lights out at any moment. And, and in terms of how it felt, I can't really tell you. Uh, I just remember coming round probably a minute later, you know, and uh, there was no pain or anything like that other than the pain of losing uh, and the embarrassment of taking this big shot. But yeah, uh, fantastic fighter to go in there. I've got my utmost respect for it. Arthur Abrams, a fantastic fighter. But, uh, yeah, as I say, you know, I, I, it wasn't the greatest preparation for me. Uh, but, as I say, would the result be different? I'm not going to, you know, ball and say, yeah, it would have been. I don't know. I think I would have given him a good fight and probably lasted a little bit longer into the later rounds. But uh, if I'd stayed on, if I'd stuck to the game plan, who knows? But 
would have got the result, probably not in Germany, but there you go. You mentioned at the start that you, you learnt stuff that you will teach on to the guys that you now train. Yeah, yeah, going into a fight with the wrong mindset. Going into a fight, literally, like, I'm not really, I don't really, I'm not bothered about winning. It's a, it's a, it's a, a life-changing opportunity in terms of the money that was going to be took from the fight. So it meant that I could retire from the sport and set up my businesses and so forth. So in that respect, it was really good, you know, to be able to, it's, it's, you know, you can thank Arthur Abrams, if you like, for me being able to do the shop and, and all the rest of it in some respect, uh, because I was careful with my money when I was in there and I, I didn't squander it away, so to speak. Uh, so it was life-changing in that respect. It didn't make me a millionaire overnight, of course not. But it made me enough that I could go on and live. And that was some of the lessons I can learn. My kids, uh, you know, you don't need to make millions and millions out of the sport to go and, and make a life after. I think it's important that you, you look at life after the sport as well, during the sport. I know that sounds crazy and most people are probably saying, no way, no, no, you got to concentrate for it. But I believe, you know, probably about the last three or four years of my career, I was solely concentrating on what I was going to actually do after boxing. I think a lot of people don't do that. A lot of pro boxers don't do that. Uh, and they end up going back to their old day job and whatever. When I made the break from BT and I left the, the, the second time, so to speak, I knew I was never coming back, mate. You know, it was a, I, was, I was certain that I was going to have to set something up now. Uh, it's a tough sport, you know, and so I can give a lot of advice to my fighters about how they look after the money, what they do to hopefully, even if they don't make it to the stage, you know, the, the, the world stage, so to speak, and the millions of pounds, that even with the money that we can make them, that they can actually go on and, and live a life after. That's, you know, literally one of the things I can learn from it. And as I say, learning from the fact that don't ever go into a fight uh, and try and change your game plan midway through. You know, your mindset's completely wrong. Absolutely. I also wanted to mention, you went over to America a few times, a bit of training with Goody Petronelli. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, uh, Marvin Hagler's trainer. What did you learn yeah. from Petronelli? Oh, massive. It was, I think it was, I think it was part of the reason why I had a, a resurrection on my career, so to speak. I went over to him the first time, uh, 205, and, and I went to, I went and trained with Goody probably about eight or nine times over that period. I'd go there every opportunity I could, to be fair. Uh, he wanted me to go and live there, but it, I was just late in my career. Uh, so for me, it just didn't, it wouldn't work like that. But in terms of how we got on and, and what I learned from Goody was unreal. Uh, the left hook that, that, that came back into my armory, so to speak, uh, that my trainer didn't believe that I had came back, and that was through the you know through through Goody Petronelli and and working on that sort of shot on there. Uh, just the experience, the sparring that I go on that I got over there was second to none. Hence, why I used to what I do basically before every fight I used to have. Then is I would I would fly, uh, book a flight straight to America, go out to America, train with Goody for three weeks, and then I come back and finish the rest of my training camp over here. So I'd have five or six weeks with Paddy and I'd finish it over here but I'd mainly got a lot of sparring in and stuff at the start uh, before I started but the things that I learned uh, and the different styles that I had to deal with I believe you know really helped my career massively going forward uh, and yeah it was a massive part of the reason why I could come back and beat the likes of you know the Howard Eastman's of this world and, and a good win against Steve Bendel obviously for the English title as well. You mentioned about um, you made a comeback. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment with comebacks. What is it about boxing that keeps bringing people back in? Yeah, you know, if I miss training, I'll be honest, <laughs> even though I'm training every day now, like a nutter. I'm probably training harder now than I did when I was training, in between fights and stuff. I don't miss the training so much, but... Uh, I think that the buzz of the crowd, uh, the, when you've been in there and, you, you know, in them sort of atmospheres, it's hard to get away from. You know, uh, you kind of go from, I remember when I lost my first fight as a pro, mate, and it was like literally the phone was off the hook before that. And then you're losing all of a sudden. It's like, you know, where is everyone? And I was on my own, this little flat, just thinking, geez, you know, this is, it was a lot of soul searching, to be fair. And I think that's why Lawrence Murphy had to be one of my, uh, when, I, when I made the comeback, I had to be one of the fights that I had to have. Uh, to get, get rid of the demons, really, to get that out of my system. Uh, but, yeah, uh, very lonely times. And, and I think people find that when they retire from the sport. All of a sudden, you know, you've been the man that everyone wants to speak to and whatever, and now all of a sudden, you know, no one really wants to talk to you as such. Uh, someone said something to me many years ago, and it always stuck in my mind uh, when I was uh, starting off and I was training out in London at the old Frank Maloney gym. Uh, the Maloney Fight Factory, I was training it there. And somebody says to me at the end of the day, if you come out of this sport with one friend, you've done well. Which is, 
which is a bit crazy really to think about it. But at that time, I actually felt that way. That there wasn't really anyone there to go, you know, come on, son, dust yourself off. Let's get back up. You know, you're better than that. You know, anyone can get beat kind of thing. So uh, it's it's not like a football match, is it, when you lose one week and you can come back the next with boxing it. And, and sometimes it takes, but it did for me. It took years to sort of bury that loss uh, and move on and, and go forward again. And, but you need that. And, you know, this game's all about your mindset and the way you approach it. Uh, and as I say, if you're not believing in yourself, uh, then it's it's really hard, especially when you've not really got people there tapping you on the back, telling you, you know, come on, you, you're better than this, you can do it. And, and at that time, I just didn't feel there was many people around. And it was probably part of the reason why a little bit later on, I did kind of walk away from the sport for a little bit. So right, let's talk of Tony Bellew and David Hay making comebacks. Um, would you advise them to come back or would you advise them to stay retired and find find something else to occupy their time? They've been two, you know, you've mentioned two guys there have been very fortunate. There's some there literally that, you know, you could understand them probably trying to want to come back. And, you know, there's been times at the start of box club when I'd throw my boxing money into it and it was a slow starter. And I'm thinking, bloody hell, but I'm still a little bit, yeah, I, can, I can get in there. You know, I'm, I might make a comeback for the money. If you don't do, need to do it for the money. Uh, and I think as soon as you start fighting, which is what I did at the end of my career, I think as soon as, for me personally anyway, I'm not saying this is for everyone, but I think as soon as you start fighting purely for the money, then uh, for me, it just takes the edge away from it. For me, it was always about wanting to win titles and wanting to win fights. The money was secondary. It was a bonus. You know, it was never about the money. They're obviously done well in their careers. They don't need to worry about the money side of it. They're doing it for their own sanity or whatever you may be. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it. But, you know, at the end of the day, who knows? They've obviously, they might still have demons that they want to get rid of. No one really knows. You know, no one really knows what's going through a boxer's mind. They might still have things that they want to still put to sleep. Uh, I'll be honest, I've done that little comeback with a... No, I say comeback. I've done the charity fight with Tony Oki. Uh, and we knocked 10 bells out of each other for six rounds uh, a couple of years ago. And that was to expel my demons because in my last fights, I knew that I didn't do myself justice. And so the people that came to the, to the, to the charity fight with, with Oki were people that were at that fight. That people that I felt had frauded because I, you know, I said I'd gone in there, you know, with the intention of winning when really I probably didn't realise I wasn't going to win because of situations that was happening. So uh, that was a way of getting rid of my demons. I remember speaking on the mic after it and just saying, you know, hopefully I've redeemed myself tonight, you know, literally against a, a big light heavyweight uh, who doesn't stop coming forward, he doesn't stop punching. You know, there's no, well, we were in 16 ounce gloves, but there wasn't nothing, you know, we didn't hold back, we went for it and, and you know, that was my way of doing myself. So, who knows, maybe Tony and, and David have, have, have got something that they feel they need more closure on. Uh, I, you, know, you know, Ricky Hatton done it, didn't he? Uh, uh, he had the same thing. But I think it's important we need that, we need that closure. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, not going to knock anyone who does that. Me personally, I wouldn't, I think it's, it's too much of a brutal sport. Uh to be wanting to put yourself, especially as you get in older, your reflexes go and fade. And I found that when I'd done the, the, the charity bet, I used some of my amateur boxes for some of the spine. I thought, geez, you know, a few years ago, he wouldn't have caught me with that shot. And, you know, I had to tighten up my defence a little bit. So your reflexes go, your speed and your punch power. Again, I can look brilliant on the bags even now, you know, uh, and, and shadow boxing and whatever. That You can look brilliant doing that. But in terms of obviously your reflexes and stuff, I think they, they diminish massively. So it all depends who they're going to fight against. Uh, and good luck to the guys, but, you know, and hopefully they stay safe and well. But it's not something I'd advise, I'd say. Once you, once you hang them up, thankfully I've been able to do that. I've been able to hang them up and, and stay and stay that way. And just finally, Wayne, before I let you go, uh, you mentioned uh, you've got a couple of pros now. Let's give them a little plug. What are their names? And when yeah. you hopefully see them out. Look out for these guys, yeah. Brandon Jones, uh, Great, fantastic kid, light heavyweight. Uh, Says so won the nationals, won the CYPs. Good kid. I've got big hopes for him. He's beat the the current GB guy who's there in number one spot. He's beat the current GB elite champion in the amateurs, and I've got big big hopes for him. And the other one is the first kid I trained in. I say he's a dynamite kid, Elliot Hurley. And again, uh, you know his style. Honestly, you will love James. You will love his style. He's not. He's been trained. He was the first kid I trained. Remember, I was still a pro boxer when I started training him as such so he hasn't been trained like an amateur at all he was always geared up for the pros and if you've seen him you'll know he's like a little money pack here he gets in there his angles are safe for his big punch in and he's just non-stop mate he's like someone's just weighing him up before he goes for that first bell uh, and he's all action and I just think that people will love 
love his style. Brandon's a little bit more conserved, you know, he thinks about what he's doing. He's more of a, I think he fought a fantastic fighter. Uh, his punch powers, he's getting older now, he's, you know, getting, uh, as we're going into the pros, I've just said, like, literally in the amateurs, it was all about quantity. Now it's about quality. So we've had to change their training regime. But the improvements of them both, as I say, I was really excited to see them back. They've, they've gone with uh, BCB promotions with Errol Johnson. Uh, they'll be boxing out on, on, on their cards. Uh, but there was on two shows and I was so excited to see them out and to show people these two kids. And it's phenomenal that how much they've come on. But, you know, hopefully you'll get to see them very soon when this, when this lockdown's all, all, all over. Absolutely. I look forward to seeing them in action. Wayne, Not thank well. you for the time of speaking to us at Pro Boxing Fans. No pleasure. Uh, good luck, guys. Stay safe and take care.